All right, we're going to find out if I am going live. And it looks like I am. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Ann Sig. And it may be good morning for some of you. Hey, all right, that is awesome. We have successfully arrived. Um, so, hey, some of you I haven't connected with in the last few weeks. So, Happy New Year to everybody. I hope you're all doing really, really awesome. And um, today is a big day. Today is a very big day. Um, this is the culmination today with the material that I'm going to present to you is the culmination of an activity I had 10 years ago. And I had wanted for the longest time to revive that. And it's finally arrived. It's finally arrived. So it's kind of like a birthday for me. So um, this has so much been my heart's desire. And it's coming through today. Um, can you folks write in the comment? Okay, hi, Judah. Hi, Lisa. Now I see it on my desktop. Hi, Janine. Welcome. All righty. That's awesome. Yay. Systems are go. So like I say, this is a really big, big moment for me. So I'm super excited to share this with you. And so I'm going to have to share my screen. There we are. So welcome, everybody, to my Ann Sieg Book Club. And this has not been my first rodeo on this. No, no, no. I've done this before, and now we're going to revive it, and it's getting kicked off today. So I'm going to move that out of the way there, as I state. So I want to make sure I'm able to communicate with you guys over here. All right. Hey there, Debbie in the house from Tumble, Texas. Hey there, Debbie. Go ahead, right in the panel if you're here, so I can welcome you. Thank you. All right. So I'm reviving a leadership program I had back in 2009 and 2010. Yeah, a decade ago, right? And I had over 2,000 members join me in one of these two programs that I had. It was actually Renegade Breakthrough Mentorship Program. I couldn't find the screenshot of it. Um, but Renegade Breakthrough and then my leader circle, where in the leader circle over a year's time, Hi there. Hi, Robert. Welcome. Um, I interviewed a whole number of business leaders and authors. And the very first one was with, um, actually not the first one, first one was with um, Daniel Coyle, The Talent Code. So I'm reviving that, and I'm, I'm really excited. Okay. So you are going to have the opportunity at the end of this session to gain ongoing access to my monthly book club plus the opportunity to join my revived leadership and mentorship program. All right, the beginning, the beginning. Ugh, this can get emotional, so just hang with me, is I do need to thank my very first mentors. Can you guys figure out who that is? Who are these people? Go ahead and write in the comment section. Hi, Janine, calling in from Maine. Judith says she can't wait. Who are these people? All right, you go ahead and take a guess. Um, these are brands that I had about five, six years ago. Um, Renegade is like over a decade. It's 12 years strong. Anyways, um, this is one of my many live events. And yes, that is my mom and my dad. And they set my foundation for success in life. There's a beautiful verse that I love. Um, it says, the boundary lines have fallen. In pleasant places, I have a godly heritage. The boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places. Uh, one of the versions says a goodly heritage. And so I thank God that I have the parents that I do. So, all right, you guys have all heard the saying, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Everybody, anybody hear that saying before? You know, when, when you determine that you're going to, I'm going to go for this, and I really want to succeed. I'm going to make this happen. And then all of a sudden, these resources start showing up in front of you. That's because you're ready. Those resources were always there. You just didn't see them, right? With me on that? So this is Coach Kurt. Many of you know who Coach Kurt is. And I have this here because he was my first online mentor. 
first online mentor, and I was very ripe and ready. It wasn't like I was in a slumber and half asleep. No, I was quite the go-getter, and I was ready to go, and I knew what I wanted to accomplish. So I thank Coach Kurt for that, being my first online mentor. These are my mentors that set my foundation for online success. In other words, that preceded me coming online. And by how many years? I don't know. Maybe five, six, seven years where I was steeped deep into business leadership books that I was applying. My husband and I had many, many different businesses. Um, I was applying into my life. And that created the fertile soil for when I came online. Does that make sense, everyone? So I had been nurturing and developing my mindset before I came online, which was 15 years ago. It was May of 2004. Hi there, Janine. Right in the panel, anyone else who's rolling in? So you see them. It's Robert Kiyosaki, Michael Gerber, Napoleon Hill, and Paul Zane Pilzer. Boom. See this? Yeah, some of these books are kind of worn. Some I had to reorder because I passed these books out to other people. And, they're, you know, I, I, I bought these books multiple times for other people, right? So these are the actual books that I'm going to showcase today, the ones that I just held up that help build my foundation as an entrepreneur. And a foundation is indeed what you need, and you need to constantly cultivate it. It is never a one-time deal, I assure you. <laughs> we have to constantly nurture this soil as much as one would take care and attention to taking supplements and all that kind of stuff. You know, you want maximum health? Well, this is for maximum wealth. It's to constantly fertilizing that soil. So Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cash Flow Quadrant, The E-Myth Revisited, Think and Grow Rich, and the next next millionaires and I got to tell you you know these are books that I read before I came online okay and it was hard to trim it down so as I'm launching my new book club this is kind of an exception where I'm going through a whole stack of them and then we'll move on next month where it'll be one book that's being featured okay but for today it's unique it's a launch hey there Don hope the little one is doing well and hi there, Peter, calling in from Liverpool. Awesome. And Joanne here, listening. Okay, so I'm going to go through each of these books and share with you some principles. Some of these principles will just go zipping right over your head, just like they do for me when I'm reading any kind of a new book, and that's why I underline and highlight and put in asterisks. And yes, I devour books. I eat them. They're, I don't keep them pristine. They are mine to own. So this one, for example, my eldest son, I said, you're going to read this book. Okay, That's his highlighting. He and I read through this book multiple times. Then he became my business partner, and we went on to create $20 million in sales together. It was planted in the seeds of these books. So don't be afraid to own your books. See this, guys? And you write in your own little notes. See? I wrote in notes there. It's okay. I'm giving you permission. All right, so here we go. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, principle one. The rich don't work for money. Now, a lot of these statements are called what's counterintuitive. You go, what? No way. That doesn't make any sense. Bear with it. It means it's counterintuitive to how you know things to be true. And as you develop yourself as an entrepreneur, you develop a different lens. It is a different lens than what your average Joe has, 100% guaranteed. The rich have a different lens. They view the world differently. The poor do not. Thems are the facts, and it's all to do with up here, all right? So who else? Hey there, Tim. Welcome. Good deal. All right. The poor and the middle class, they go and they work for money. But the rich, they have money work for them. That's a study. It's an endeavor. It's, you have to learn about that. That's where their focus is, right? Poor and middle class, just turning the, turn the tail, making the money, making the mind, money. All right? Stick with me. By the way, these are rather cursory. I don't go deep. If you like what I'm talking about in any one of these books, you know what to do next. Go buy the book. 
Principle two is mind your own business. Now, this is one of the most important principles from this book. It's a game changer. Robert Kiyosaki says because of the way, the way the tax structure system is set up, everybody should have a kitchen table business because there's tax advantages to take, up, take advantage of, right? Now for him, that's the number one reason. So he does this little training inside the book and I'm gonna go through it rather cursory. The non-business owner, employee, is your income, you're working for someone, right? Then your expenses, you know, your whole litany of expenses that you have in your household, food, car, yada, yada, yada. But you are working for the government, household through taxes. You all get that, right? And you work like five or six months out of the year, pay your taxes, did you know that? Something to track, and I know it changes relative to changes in tax law and whatnot, but it's a chunk of your life you are working to pay the government, right? All right, liability over here. You're working for the bank. Should you have a mortgage? Anyone? Mortgage? Yes, yay, nay. Some of you have a mortgage. What do you have? You got interest or you have principal and you have interest. And you know what the interest looks like, right? You're working for that. And then if you have a car loan or a credit card debt, same old gig. Got the principal, woof, and you got the interest. Okay, that's what their balance sheet looks like. Okay, and again, he goes into what much more detail in his book. Now, the business owner, they've got a different balance sheet. This funny thing right in the middle, it's tipped upside down. That's the personal corporation that you have. All right, and I'm not gonna go into the nuances of s and LLC and all that fun stuff. That's not the purpose here. He's trying to make the business case that when you have a business, whether that be a side business, which many of you have, some of you maybe you want to stay. Do you have a side business? You got a side hustle going on, right? And some of you are going, I know I am. I'm going full bore. This is I'm going to make a full-time income from my business, right? So your income comes in from your business, and your business is an asset. And he really wants that crystal clear for the definition of asset and liability. By the way, the overarching thing of all of this is what he calls financial intelligence. It is not taught in the school systems. Do not rely on the schools to be teaching your children this stuff because they're not. I homeschooled for 12 years. I made the decision. I'm going to be teaching my kids. I'm the headmaster. Out of that, I've developed business partners with my, my children. All right. Anyways, all to say, there you are with when you have your business and you generate income from that, well, you also have expenses, right? So you've got that income, it flows in there, but here's the differentiator, pay close attention. Those expenses that you have in writing your business, those are your, that reduce your taxes, your income, right? And that makes it so that you're not paying as much of an, um, as much on taxes for that income. Does that make sense? Because you get to take out the expenses that you have for running your business. Okay, everyone following me so far? Again, this is rather cursory, but you're playing at a different ball field now than people who have strictly an employee position. So let's move on. So the quick summary about that, from I'm just gleaning out the most important concepts, if you will. The rich with corporations, they earn, they spend, and then they pay their taxes. With me? So they're taxed on less. Can everyone register with me? Does that make sense? Okay. So they're paying less for taxes. And one may say, wow, what a ripoff. That's not fair. Well, I don't know all the decisions behind that other than that it is true that corporations create jobs. I am certain I've paid out millions of dollars worth of wages since I formed my corporation in 2006. In wages. In wages. People have bought homes and cars and they support their families by working for me, my corporation. So we create jobs. Everyone with me on that? So the government, it's just the way it's set up here in the US, I don't know for the UK, Peter, um, but you, you earn, you spend, and then you pay your taxes. Now people who work for those corporations, 
they earn, they pay taxes, well, that's a bigger chunk then, and then what's left over, that's what they get to spend. Now, one of the most important things that you can teach your children is the importance of a balance sheet, a P&L sheet. And you're going, Anna, I don't even know how to do that myself. Well, that's something that you want to do, and that's where you're going to gain the value and, un and the understanding as an entrepreneur. I'm going to say in summary, I think this is the last slide on that book. Let me just jump forward. Oh, no, I'm not done. Okay, keep going. Principle number three, work to learn, don't work for money. Again, totally counterintuitive. By far, of anything I learned from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it is this principle. And I'm always saying it back almost as a mantra to my husband. No, every skill I learn, Brian, I am securing my future. So I don't flinch at skill building like some people do. Oh, no, I got to learn what now? Hey, learn or die. Wake up, folks. 21st century. Learn or die. It's simple. And some go, well, I guess I'm going to die. Yes, and that is what you will do. You will die. Because this is the 21st century where the number one skill is for you to be able to adapt. Make no mistake about it. Things change virtually overnight. You can't keep up with it fast enough. And some say, I'm just going to pull the blanket over my head and go to sleep. Have at it. You will not survive. You will die. All right? So principle three is work to learn, don't work for money. This is actually a screenshot in one of my three business primers. So by the way, the seeds of my father, so to speak, through their writings, when I came online two, three years later, I had $4.2 million in sales with my very first ebook. My forefathers, if you will, my rich dad mentors, the seeds of, of their mentorship is what made me so ripe and ready for fast success. You following me? And my attitude is always, I will embrace that, a skill set, because that's going to help secure my future. And women, we outlive men by a margin, significant. So women, we got, we got some work to do, more so, just saying. Hey there, anyone else? Joanne, good. Okay. All right, so let's keep moving. Principle number four, and then I believe this is where I give it a wrap on this one. Overcoming obstacles. Everyone, you all have obstacles? Or maybe there's some of you who have no obstacles, but I think we can all raise our arms maybe like this even. I'm, I'm raising it with you. They are fear, cynicism. Oh, cynicism, it'll kill you. Laziness, bad habits, and arrogance, a lack of humility, okay? And I'm just going to focus on the top one. Here it is. It's not fear that is the problem. That's going to happen whether we like it or not, right? It's how you handle fear, and it's how you handle losing. It's how you handle failure that makes the difference in someone's life, not just money. The primary difference between a rich person and a poor person is how they handle fear, all right? So what I do with my entrepreneurs that I coach and develop is I tell them ahead of time, you're going to make mistakes. But we actually have a procedure when you make a mistake. Afterwards, you look at an action you executed, you go, well, what worked? You write them down. What didn't work? And what would I do differently? That's a learner's mindset. But so many people have the poverty mindset that when they hit failure, boom, flare goes up in the sky. I knew it. It's time to quit. Wrong. It's wrong, okay? So you want to, when that fear happens, here's how I looked at fear. It's the door I have to walk through to success. Like it or not, tuck cookies, put on the big girl panties, walk through that fear door, and suck it up. You with me, everybody? There's no escaping it. And then what happens is you habituate yourself against the fear. Because then you look back and you go, that wasn't so bad. I, I can do this again. But the person who quakes at every piece of fear and they have to have assurance for every single little thing before they move ahead, they're done. They are done. And you can see it. Yeah, we have group pages. You see the mindset manifested in how people write. Am I true or true on that, guys? You know that's true. All righty. 
So let's take what we can learn from this. Now we're shifting into the next book. Let us see how I'm doing time-wise. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, we are in, oh, my beloved cash flow quadrant. I'm not going to go very far into this. I just have two screens. Really, um, one of my best quotes from Robert Kiyosaki, he says, intelligence is the ability to make finer distinctions. And that's how I can, when people say really these very general statements, they lack that ability to define things more clearly to make better distinctions. All right? That's not how, what he defines as intelligence. So how, what does that have to do with this? Well, he's taking financial intelligence, education, and he's, he's trying to break it down into a way that you can better understand and kind of get a context of maybe where you stand, where you stand, and the whole scope of, of money and your life. All right, so we're going to go through this. Four ways to produce income. So the E is an employee, and they have a job. And that is what the school systems raise us to be. Go to school to get good grades so you can have a good job, and so you can have benefits, and what's the last thing there? And security with the pension, right? That's the mantra. That is from the industrial world. And when I was giving this kind of training a decade ago, the average change of profession was 7.5. Just saw an article the other day, it's broaching close to 12 times when people change their profession. Why are they changing profession so much? What's changed? Why in a decade did it go from the seven up to past 11%? I'll tell you why. Why don't you guys write in? What do you think? Hey there, Chris. Hey, Chris, super happy for your big sales at the trade show. That $4,800 sale, boom. You're awesome, Miss Chris. All right, okay, so, um, because of these books, it enforced all the more. I'm not going to have my kids indoctrinated. No way. I'm the mama. I'm in charge. And they were taught business in high school and junior high. You know, the more businesses they could test and run through in those formative years, the better. And it was, I would just say, hey, don't worry about it. You know, if, whether you succeed or not, just you're going to learn something. My son Isaiah must have done seven, eight different businesses when he was in high school. And then, you know, it's just, I was just like, I was giving them permission. It's okay. It's a, and it's going to be okay to fail because it's through the failure that you're going to learn. So he had the benefit of doing that, you know, as a youngster, if you will. I was in high school. And then before you know it, he was looping in his little brother, and they had an eBay business, and they're selling swords out of, out of our house. I encouraged it like crazy. Now my son in China is opening up multiple businesses. Where did that come from? Their home. We taught them from the home to be entrepreneurs, the mama and the papa, and the books that I share with my sons. All right, let's keep going here. You can see I get kind of passionate about this. So we're going to go from the top left, and now we're going down to the lower left, which is self-employed, owning a job. Check this out. It means that unless you put in that time doing the work, you won't get paid. So that would be all the arbitrage models. Um, the online arbitrage is more leveraged. But the scanning, right, all that, that is basically, yeah, you're a business owner by, you know, those of you who have chosen to set up a corporation. You don't have to as an Amazon seller, by the way. But that is basically a glorified job. And I say that very respectfully because my husband and I had a windshield replacement business for 12 years. It was that quadrant. It was the S quadrant. My husband wanted to grow and expand it, but I was homeschooling at that time, and I said, no, no, I do not want to deal with employees right now. And I could tell I kind of bummed him out, but I'm like, no, my top priority is the boys. You know? And so basically it was a total linear income business that he was only as good as his last windshield that he replaced. Does this make sense? Hey there, Gwen. Making sense, everybody? You're only as good as your last scan. 
You're only as good as your last shipment. You're only as good as your last windshield replacement. Now, that business served us really, really well, the windshield business, but it was not the B quadrant. Check that out. Look at the top right. 95% wealth, that's what they're doing, um, that they own 95% of the wealth, by the way. A business owner, what's the difference? Can you guys write it in the panel? What is that? What's the difference that they have there? Okay? They own a system. And the system does the work for them, including their system of people. So Dr. Josie Shepard in our community, one of our master trainers, she has three of those that she did in a five-year sprint, starting at age 70 to age 75. She says, I check in once a month, Ann. That's including owning a warehouse in Southern California. Now, that's the true business owner definition from Robert Kiyosaki. They have systems that work with or without them. They're not needed in the daily operations. How many of you is that appealing? Can you write in the, the panel there, the comment section? How many of you does that appeal? Man, this is light. Wow, and I, I'm, my eyes are being opened up. So I'm, I'm kind of making this transition, Anne, from employee and, and then that S quadrant down there where it's basically a glorified job, but it is making money. Look at Martha. She's making a ton of money through a local retail arbitrage. But up in that top quadrant, no, that's a different world. Josie set up all the systems. She had been one of my mentorship students from seven, uh, six, seven years ago. She said, Ann, you taught me to do that. And there she is. And then you move into the I quadrant, which is through your wealth that you build in your business, you start doing the investment game, whether precious metals, crypto, real estate, more businesses that you build and sell, okay? Make sense, everybody? So the goal is to move to the right. With me? Okay. And the book goes into it in much greater detail. Um, here was a nice another little image. Um, if you Google this, you're going to see lots of these. Okay, so again, E, if you have a job, the S, you're self-employed. Some of you may be a sole proprietor, for example. If you haven't set up an S Corp, an LLC, or a C Corp, you are by default a sole proprietor, okay? But you own a job because if you don't show up, you don't make money, right? The business owner, you own a system and people who work for you. And then an I is when the money works for you. From the wealth you create as a business owner, now you're going to take that wealth and multiply it. Okay, fantastic book, changed my life forever. By the way, this is why if you trip over any of my past business, business primers, every single one of them, without exception, talks about the importance of owning your own assets. It's your website. It's your email list. It's your Facebook following. It's yours, 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 and you are in control. That takes work to get there. That's not a snap of a finger. What do you do in the meantime? You leverage these other systems that have been created for you. Hmm, Amazon.com for an example. You leverage that little puppy, but you say, you know what? But in time, you're just going to be a part of my business. Because I'm going to grow wealth through my own business, my own website. All right? Okay. E-Myth Revisited. How are we doing, guys? Good. Two books in 30 minutes. Okay. Very appealing, says Debbie. Absolutely, says Gwen. All right. Love this book completely. You know, I'm a massive reader, so I'm always having to, you know, fill my husband in at the end. Okay, Brian. Brian, you got to listen. Brian, you know. Hey, you know what, Brian? I found out. And I'm always having to turn around and teach and talk it through. That's how I digest information. So there it is. There's been many editions of this. Don't worry about, oh, my gosh, was it the fifth or the sixth or the 15th? Just get the book. You'll be fine. Okay, so he talks, this is just such an eye-opener. He talks about the entrepreneur, the manager, and the technician. And when you're starting out, they all have to fit under one hat. So we're going to kind of go through these rather quickly, the definition of these. And as we do that, you can maybe write in the comment section, yeah, I'm that one, or I'm that one. You may be all of them. 
You could be blessed in that way that you have the attributes of all three, but not many people do, okay? So the entrepreneur is the visionary in us, the dreamer, the energy behind every human activity, the imagination that sparks the fire of the future. Think of Elon Musk with his new cars, right? The catalyst of the future. Oop, I wrote that sentence twice. Anyways, you get the idea. Okay, that is decidedly me. <laughs> I am constantly casting out a vision for the future. It, it's, I don't know how to explain it. It's just who I am. Hey, Tim, that's awesome. Let's finish email. Boom. That's beautiful. Okay. The managerial personality is pragmatic. And without the manager, there would be no problem, no order, and no predictability. So that manager is a really important role because if you are just the entrepreneur and you're just ever the dreamer, but you don't know how to distill it down into actionable steps and manage those steps, well, that's kind of, I suppose, when you get those scoffers who laugh at the entrepreneur, the big dreamer, which is a shame. I always encourage people because this is the heart and the essence of humanity of, of what gives us a hope for the future are our dreams and aspirations. I have huge aspirations. I always will. I think big. I want to think big. And others, they, they think small and then they grow from there. However that works for each and every one of you, that's up to you. But really think about your own life. How big a vision do you want to cast? Is it itty bitty? Uh, the ceiling's going to be right here? Or is it going to be a big vision? And I'm not talking about, well, I'm going to make $50 million. I'm not talking about that kind of vision. My vision is mostly about, my, my vision is the people economy. That is where I have been placed in my life, is the people economy and developing talent in people. That's my passion. I ran on a sports gym for 15 years. I developed my own coaches, my own curriculum, everything. I, that's, I groom up the talent, all right? So let's keep going here. Where the entrepreneur lives in the future, the manager lives in the past. The entrepreneur craves control, the manager lives in the past. All right, where the entrepreneur thrives on change, the manager compulsively clings to the status quo because they're trying to manage it, I cap it up. The entrepreneur is going this way. Can you see where there's this dichotomy that has to be reckoned with as an entrepreneur. And so he just kind of puts this out there and for us to then self-identify with who we are and then we start to see why there's sometimes there's this internal grappling. I'll tell you another thing it does for you is you start to see where kind of who you are and where maybe, just maybe, you need someone who compliments you. Like maybe you're just so not a manager. You just don't have it, right? Well, then maybe you need to find someone that you should compliment yourself with, conceivably do a partnership. That's a whole other concept and training there for you. Um, but it brings about this level of self-recognition and identification as you go through EMET Revisited. All right, so where the entrepreneur invariably sees the opportunity in events, the manager they invari invariably see the problem. So, you know, the entrepreneur, hey, we could do that. Hey, they get so excited. And the manager, oh, wait, hold on. That's going to run into this, 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 and that. You with me, folks? And both have a part, an important integral part here. It's not like one is not and one isn't. Okay, the manager builds a house and then lives in it forever. It's set. It's done. We ain't changing. Ah, oh, but that entrepreneur is always pressing forward. The entrepreneur builds a house and the instant it's done, begins planning the next one. All right. The manager creates neat, orderly rows of things. But the entrepreneur creates the things that the manager has to grab and put into those rows. <laughs> is anyone getting a picture of this at all? Okay. Thank you. Peter is posting The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. Awesome. Hashtag by Debbie. Dream big. All right, the manager is the one who runs after that entrepreneur to clean up their mess. 
But without that entrepreneur, there would be no mess to clean up. Ooh, see how they work? They've got to come together somehow, right, folks? Okay. Without the manager, there could be no business, no society. But without the entrepreneur, there would be no innovation, right? So it's the tension between the entrepreneur's vision and the manager's pragmatism that creates the synthesis from which all great works are born. I practically get into tears with that particular statement because there's two people on my team where this is so true. <laughs> I'm going to say it. It's me, and then and Lisa is my pragmatist. And without my Lisa, it wouldn't be the great and beautiful work that it's become here, especially at the e-commerce business school, because she's the one who puts it all in order, makes it all clean and tidy. She's brilliant with that. So speaking of people who compliment you, Lisa really compliments me. And she compliments me and, and sees the, the dreamer part and actually encourages me. But then she kind of comes in with, well, these are some considerations we need to be aware of. She's the pragmatist. The technician is the doer. If you want it done right, do it yourself is the technician's credo. All right, so I'm not going to go into all the attributes of the technician, but basically the premise of the book, you guys know it's about the pie baker, the person who knows how to bake pies. And um, they're great at baking pies. I know I'm going to be a pie baker and have a business selling pies. And that's where Michael Gerber says, oh, not so fast. Just because you're a technician and you have the skill to deliver and make something does not mean you know how they know how to run a business. So this one really struck me during our windshield replacement years as my husband, I told him, I said, oh, Brian, Brian, you know, you're, you're, you're the technician. You're the guy who knows how to put in the windshields. You know, and I, I had to excitedly share this with him, and we need to follow this guy and what he's saying here. So it's kind of this revelation, and this is why most businesses do start out by someone being the technician. They know how to create cupcakes or make cupcakes. They know how to, um, um, oh, I don't know, write books, so many different things. They know how to do it. Now I'm going to do a business selling this, right? But they have no idea of the hierarchy of running a business. They have the skill set, the technician skill set, but they don't know how to run a business. Really big deal. All right. So the technical work of a business and a business that does technical work are two totally different things. All right. So set up your strategies for scale and growth. Now, this slide, again, just like in the cash flow quadrant with the B quadrant, some of you, that's tugging at you. Some of you are like, I don't give a rip. I, ha I have no interest to do that. But some of you do. All right. So in email, and again, and this is my world, by the way. I'm much more interested in creating the, the business owners that own systems that work for them. That is much more inspiring to me. Why? Because then you can go create wealth and you can affect change in the world. That's why. Entrepreneurs have the power to affect positive change in the world. So this is about setting up strategies for scale and growth. So if you have a growth mindset, these are what you're going to need. You're going to need an organizational strategy. You're going to need a management strategy. You're going to need your people strategy. You're going to need a marketing strategy, which has been my expertise if you read my books. And you're going to need a system strategy. So for those of you who are, for example, arbitrage sellers, you're already starting to do some of this. And you can do this now in a more volitional way that is, yeah, I'm doing that here. But my end goal is to go there into the B quadrant where I really have a system that works for me. So now I'm going to be much more aware and in tune to these dynamics and how they fit into my current efforts and how I can really develop them more for when I go big, when I really want to have growth mode and scale. Make sense, everybody? Good. All righty. Think and grow rich. Uh, this one right here. Definitely my most worn out book here. So um, here's the scoop on that. 
I have a full video training series on Think and Grow Rich on our e-commerce business school Facebook page. And we have compiled Lisa. Remember, she's the one who does the rose. She gets everything very neat and tidy and beautiful like she did last night. I'm like, oh my gosh, Lisa, that's beautiful. So she has that for you. Thank you for David for pulling the links off the page, getting everything organized. I'm not quite sure where that's going to get posted, um, but Lisa's going to somehow get that to you. She has magical powers, okay? I'm just saying, and you're going to have that. And by the way, it was a nine series, video series, just on Think and Grow Rich, okay? So I hope that you all can take advantage of that as a special little gift, okay? Next, this is my last book I want to review. Now I got a little bit of the sniffles going on. Pardon me. The Next Millionaires by Paul Zane Pilzer. Now, I met him at a book signing, and I got a picture with him somewhere, but I don't know where it is. Um, but this book, in a sense, this is, this is the much bigger picture book for me because it has to do with economics. And I know some of you go, economics, ugh, that's a word like chemistry, <laughs> ugh, you know, and it just sounds awful. Well, I grew up in a household where my dad talked economics constantly. That's what I grew up with, specifically Austrian economics, Ludwig van Mises. So some of you, you're going, oh, yeah, 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 because there's different schools of economics. And, and trust me, they are worlds and universe apart for the net effect of what it means to human endeavor through those schools, those thoughts of economics. So I ascribe to a free market um, uh, theory of economics or implementation. So nonetheless, oh, thank you, Lisa. There it is. God bless Lisa. So this is the book. I had to reorder. I couldn't find it. I probably gave it to somebody. But this is what really set my mindset for the whole people development space. That's my ultimate interest. We have training. Lots of people have training. My interest is in developing people and specifically developing entrepreneurs. That is what I have been called to do. Through my years as a sports coach, my years of homeschooling, my years with my husband, we had a real estate business, we, had, um, we were in the automotive industry, but I have been ultimately led to my calling is in the people development space. And one could say that's one of the highest order skill sets to have or even caring to do that because it requires a lot of investment into people. You're taking part of who you are and you're, you're, you're giving it out of yourself and you're pouring it into other people. So it's this, this pouring out and it's just how some people have been wired and that's what I've been wired to do. So the economy of people is I am raising up a tribe of leaders to go out and to succeed in their businesses and to create wealth and change and effect first and foremost within their families, first and foremost, by following here what I'm sharing with you today and what I'm going to be sharing more of you with, but you will most decidedly change as a person. I am in no way, shape, and form the same person that I was when I first came online, even from 10 years ago. I'm not the same person. You will change as an entrepreneur. You will be tested. You will be forged. And you need someone to help you through that process. For me, these were my first mentors. It can be through a book. There's no problem there. I have hundreds of thousands of people who have read my business primers who have gone on to extreme wealth, six, seven, eight-figure income earners because I was a mentor through them, through my books, or to them, through my books. All right, let's get into this. So debunking the myth of economic scarcity. I'm not going to go deep into this one because I'm so adamantly, you know, I don't want to give it much energy because that is the school of economics I'm adamantly opposed to. So let's read it together here. All right. How's everybody doing? 
So there's a limited supply out there of land. This is the belief system. There's a limited supply out there of land, fresh water, minerals, and other vital resources. And how we divide them up among ourselves is economics. With a fixed supply of resources, the only way we're going to get ahead is by taking it from someone else. Tracking with me, everybody? Okay. That is a school of economics, and it is being applied all over the world as we speak right now. All right? Run from it because it is a falsehood and a lie. All right? That's what I'm telling you. Instead, Paul Zinkelser, who was an advisor for two different presidents, by the way, an economic advisor, he preaches, and yes, indeed, he does preach. You should all get this book, The Economics of Abundance. So we're going to go through these laws. Again, they may feel counterintuitive. No, Ann, I thought I have to take from him so I can have more. That's wrong. And that is what's being taught. It is. We got to take from him so I can have more. No. No, 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 no. What we need to do is develop people to have more by their own right and their own volition through their own empowerment. This one is a form of slavery thought to grab from someone else what is not even yours, and then, then, I'll, then I'll be better. Now I got more from him. Wrong. That's wrong. And you debase yourself by not having allowed yourself to become empowered. Okay? It's a, very, it's a slavery type of mindset. I can't stand it. All right, there we go. The first law, resources are unlimited because our minds are unlimited. What, what we're now able to do with resources that 100 years ago, they thought that was, they capped it off, the usage of certain minerals and whatnot. Oh, no. The inventions, innovations happen constantly. All right. The second law, technology determines the supply of any given resource. Technology is what's changing the world. That's why we see so much change and adaptation taking place. The third law is the advance of technology is determined by the exchange of information. In other words, the rapidity. The speed by which information is passed from one body to the next, okay? That's what uh, increases the advance of technology. The fourth law, technology determines need. He goes into this much deeper, so you're going to see a lot of focus on technology. The fifth law, there is no limit to our economy because there is no limit to demand. People say, yeah, but this industry it was just kicking butt back in 1960. It ought to be kicking butt again. No, the world has changed. And now there's new innovations, new technology. And what used to work from years ago doesn't work anymore. And so and instead, a whole new huge industry opens up. We see this constantly. The sixth law, your economic potential is defined by your technology gap. Think about this just for a moment. Those of you who are using your phone to scan, is that not a technology that you're taking advantage of and that is creating economic wealth for you? That's because of an app created by Amazon. That someone else doesn't have the app and they go, oh, that's just a bunch of hooey. You know, that's a, oh, and in fact, it's a scam. By the way, when anyone uses that term scam, that is someone who is, it's a lack of intelligence. They don't know how to make finer distinctions. So when they use that term scam, it's just the simply of a lack of education and knowledge. It doesn't mean I want, I'm trying to look down at them, but it tells me, oh, they're not educated. So they throw out these gross generalizations. That is a sign of ignorance. Okay? Anyways, all to say, um, I don't mean to do those sidebar rants. Better stay on tech. On tech. Uh, but anyways, you get the point about the app, correct? And then if you're a book scanner, you know, what changed the game for Brian? Brian Cummings. Technology, right? Okay. The edge of the entrepreneur. The greatest opportunities today are to go into yourself, go into business for yourself as an entrepreneur, is what he is saying. This is the age of the entrepreneur. It's the golden age. It has never been easier to become an entrepreneur. It's, it's nigh almost on to being ridiculous. And in fact, the only thing that limits it is the person's mindset. Because ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you, I've been to China, 
My son lives there. He's got a couple businesses. And I got to tell you, for them, the age of the entrepreneurs just opened up because they came out of the cultural revolution, which was the economic scarcity model, by the way, and caused 50, 60 million deaths, right, in China. All right, you've tracked with me? So they have come out of the cultural revolution. They are now in the golden age of entrepreneurialism. And there's, they are exploding with growth as entrepreneurs. Here in the U.S., sadly, we've been it so long that we've become inured. We don't, a lot of people just don't even see the advantages of it. They're kind of in a fog because they, it's not so new and exciting to them. But in China, it is. You couldn't own land. I mean, there are a lot of restrictions that have been lifted for them, right? Are you guys tracking with me? So they work 18 hours a day. They're so excited. I get to have my own business. Here it's like, meh, I had to do two hours of work. Yeah, forget this business thing, right? So this is the golden age. All right. Now, these are some of my favorite quotes out of the book, which, by the way, you can Google him and just type in quotes, but in the back of the book, it's so wonderful. They have the selected quotes, pages of them, and they are so rich. I, they're just beautiful. I love this one. The spiritual nature of business. The act of being an entrepreneur whew, is a theological act. It is a belief that God has given you the tools to go out, make money, and take care of your family. See, no one else has talked about this. He's the guy, back before I came online, I read this and I thought, this is so true. Oh, whoever talks about a spiritual nature of business? But there is. Dawn, you remarked on that when I did that interview with you. She was at our July trifecta. She said, it's like there's something spiritual going on here. Dawn Kumara, I don't know if she's still here. But there is a spiritual nurture, nature of business. I always told my boys, you have a calling on this planet. And I will tell you right now, whatever that calling is, it will be, it's me choked up. It'll be in the service of people. Whatever that calling is for you in your life, it will be in the service of people. So, People will make money and create wealth by owning and building their own business, love other people. Now, you may say, not some of the business owners I met, Anne. Well, I am of this belief and stripe because that is me. I wouldn't be in business any other way, and I love the part that I am developing people. So that is the summary. Oh, I got more. Business is about serving other people. The better you are at giving people something that improves their lives, the more successful you are and the more money you make. Isn't that a beautiful quote? That's something to live by, isn't it? All right, so that was the next millionaires, okay? So what does abundance business leadership look like? Wallace D. Waddles, this is a PDF you can get free on the web. It's called The Science of Getting Rich. I must have read this book at least 20 times. Okay, I'm gonna read it aloud. The more people who get rich on the competitive plane, the worse for others. The more who get rich on the creative plane, the better for others. But remember, your thought must be held on your creative plane. You are never for an instant to be betrayed into regarding the supply as limited or into acting on the moral level of the competition. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, do you see that this is, a, this is a moral mindset that you can adapt as a business leader? You know, what is leadership? Leadership means people are following you. Well, people do follow bad leaders. It's happened. Just look at the annals of history and into death, okay? And then there's good leadership, all right? So what kind of a leader do you want to become? And that's why I'm conveying these, the, more, the principles, the moral principles of business to you. Okay, we're going to have Q&A in just a moment. Okay, here's Debbie with a comment. Oh, Peter read The Wellness Revolution. I have two. 
Okay, and Debbie's saying they are not yet evolved. All right, so we're going to have Q&A. This is the link to my monthly book club sessions, ansigbookclub.com. So this is going to be um, a new book each month, many times with the book author with us, as best then as I can make those arrangements. I have interviewed people like Simon Sinek, uh, Stephen M. R. Covey, Daniel Coyle, uh, lots of business authors in the past, like from 10 years ago. Again, I'm reviving this. So many times again with the author, and I'm going to be sharing personal stories of how I implemented the teaching and principles within the books that I'll be featuring and that have helped lead me to my multi-million dollar sales success. All right, I do want everyone here to go ahead. If you did see value in today's call, this one is an exception where I just wanted to share, kind of give you a historical overview of the books that really helped give me the fertile soil so that when I did come online, I was able to run really fast. I had my self-discipline in place. I had, you know, the mindset, the moral mindset, principles taught by Paul Zane Pilzer, et cetera. But moving forward, it will be just one book a month. You'll know the book in advance so that you can get your book secured, start reading it so that when you show up for our book club session, hopefully with the author, you'll get that much more value out of that. So it's ansiegbookclub.com. All right. So I'm just going to um, do some Q&A now. Stop the share. All right. Did you guys, was anything of value to you that um, maybe just a new concept, that, that counterintuitive part? If you have any kind of comments, um, it's kind of weird with Facebook. It only lets me see like five of the most recent comments, which is kind of irritating. Um, I'm going to just look on my phone then and see if I can better view my comments. Okay, Christy is in the house. She says, I am all three in the e-myth, but lack some of the numbers and analytical skills that I need to develop. Okay, and that's really good testament to that whole thing of hopefully finding someone that compliments you and your eh, deficiency. So that, trust me, I got plenty of those. Um, you're more the entrepreneur than manager, but always a realist. Okay, <laughs> husband is the manager of me. Uh, you know what, Christy, you and me both, uh, my husband, uh, and, okay, <laughs> helping you stay accountable to reality. Okay. Oh, good, Christy. I'm glad you like that. Um, you know what, Christy? No, I haven't. Um, and that's probably one of the best questions of all is, have I determined which book that will be the first one? No, I, I apologize. That would have been good to have. Um, I will have that within the week, okay? And so our next call will be towards the end of February, all right? So again, for today, if any of these books kind of like, hmm, I should maybe learn more on that one, then feel free to do that. But I will have word out. And oh, another thing to say, this will never be broadcasted on this page again. The book club, it's in a completely separate group page. So when you go to ansaidbookclub.com, it's gonna redirect you into a group that's specifically just about the book club. So this is an inaugural uh, training here today, and it's not gonna show up here again. Those will only be broadcasted over on that group page. I want everyone to be clear on that, okay? All righty. Where are the other comments? And I only see Christy, but it's kind of, how do I open up and see more? I don't wanna miss people's comments. I don't know why that is. I'll just, here's Debbie saying, how you think, how you act, how you feel determines your personality. Your personality creates your personal reality, change your thoughts, change your life. Yeah, I'm a huge brain science um, person. Um, physiology was my favorite class in um, college. Oh my, okay, there's 52 comments, so I probably missed some. I better turn on my phone. Is there anything really pressing? That, um, okay, Judith says, it confirms I'm on the right path. Chris says, thanks, Ann. Appreciate everything you do and share with us. I'm so happy for you, Chris, and that you, um, you know, had that success at the trade show. And you're a real warrior. You're a businesswoman warrior, meaning you, you do the deal, girl. All righty. So Debbie's, Peter has read The Wellness Revolution. Thank you. And Lisa has posted um, the link to the PDF if those of you want to watch the Think and Grow Rich series. All right. Hey, do me a favor, guys. Here's a little tip for what Christy said. 
you go ahead and write in a book that you would like to see. Man, if Anne could interview this one, this author. So you guys are free to suggest to me. Um, there's a book that I was just sent by one of my longtime subscribers out in the living room. Uh, and I'm like, I love this book. So if you guys have suggestions, I mean, like I've got five books over there in reach. I've got more over there. It's kind of crazy. I, I will also want to share the ones where I read them and then I implemented. But I'm always open to more book ideas and concepts. They do hinge around. We want to focus on uh, business leadership development, personal development, etc. Okay. All right. Any other specific feedback or comments? I think we're good then. All right. Um, oh, let me just say this much. If you think this was valuable that for your Facebook friends, followers, whomever you have, that maybe they too, this book club is open to everybody. You know, um, I was teaching this stuff to my kids when I was homeschooling. So any age group can benefit from this. You go ahead and share. Um, but I suppose especially those who are looking for something different, they're in a shift mode. You might just want to preface that and say, hey, um, for those of you who, when you explain and then you say, I want to share this with you, you might gain some value about if you've given thought to growing a business or maybe you're business, in business now and struggling. You can always preface it. Okie doke. I think we're good. All righty. I'm going to give it a wrap. Thanks, everybody. You've got the links to um, get into the book club. Oh, here's Judith. Do you subscribe to any of Tony Robbins' philosophies? Yes, I've read and watched a lot of his stuff. Absolutely. I can't say carte blanche, but I got a, one of his books behind me my son gave me for Christmas one year. Hey, Joanne, way to go. All righty. Yeah, he's a, definitely a thought leader, Judith, and personal development. Okay, beautiful. All right, thanks, everybody. God bless. It was a lot of fun to spend this time together with you. And boom, the book club is off the launching pad. Let's have some fun together. Bye-bye, everybody.